Welcome to the SAG After Foundation's Conversations at Home program. I'm Janelle Riley from Variety. And now without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce from Evil, actors Katja Herbers, Mike Coulter, Asif Manvi, Michael Emerson, Christine Lottie, Kurt Fuller, and Andrea Martin. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, this is an audience of your fellow actors, and I always like to start by asking, how did you get your SAG card? What was the job that that brought that magical piece of paper to you? Um, and let's start with Kurt, because he's next to me, technically. Um, well, it was in 1976. Uh, I did. I, I drove across from San Francisco to New York uh, listening to... Uh, an eight track of Born to Run the whole way, seven days, the only eight track I had, and did a commercial. Um, and that commercial got me into SAG. What, do you remember what it was for? It was for uh, Xerox. And what? I was a Xerox repairman, I swear to God, I, who was sent to a nudist colony to repair a Xerox machine. Mm. It was actually award worthy, <laughs> really, I think. <laughs> And then I didn't work for nine years. <laughs> Are you serious? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Mike, well, it up? takes a while for people to forget. I was yeah. Gonna, yeah, uh, it really Mike, does. <laughs> Mike, for you. Oh, God. Um, uh, I think I did a job. It was a, uh, it was a I think it was a, a, was it, I think it was ER. I think, yeah, I think, I think it was ER. I think I've had a co-star on ER playing, playing a um, paramedic driver for, for this episode that we ended up doing a night shoot for. And I remember it because there's a thing called Taft Hartley or something. Mm -hmm. And that's, and that was when I learned the hard fact of like being forced to get into a union at, at the time, I think it was like $1,400 or something like that. And I did, I didn't, I don't think I cleared enough to make the money to pay for the the union fees. And so it was really kind of strange because I thought, oh, I'll get a nice little paycheck. And after I paid my agent and uh, paid my rent, I, I didn't have enough to pay for the for the union fees to get into SAG. So that was a harsh, um, a little mm -hmm. harsh um, lesson in reality. But um, but I was really excited that that year because um, I got that job and I got another one right after maybe. And that made up for the for the lack of money in the first one. But yeah, Taft Hartley. I remember that term. I was like, what do you mean Taft Hartley? I, I was like, what is that? What does that even mean? It was kind of kind of fun. I'm glad it didn't take you another nine years to get something else. Oh, he's so good, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and oh, oh, oh. No, it's because I didn't go to nudist college. That's, that's what happened. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> Andrea, for you? Oh, my God. I literally was trying to IMDB myself. <laughs> I'm like, please don't call me. Please don't call oh me. Oh, my God. What did I... You know, my career started in Canada and it was after there. And, I, and I'm, I'm trying to think what the first set, go to somebody else. And I literally am going right. to IMDB myself and maybe it will jog my memory. We'll come back to you. Michael looks like he knows. Okay. I, I believe it was Stanley Tucci's movie, The Imposters. No way. In which I took a full on punch from Alfred Molina. And wow. I have been punched out in every role I've ever played in front of the camera since then. Wow. Including this one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what year was that, Michael? Not 98, maybe. Wow. Yeah. yeah. You really do get punched a lot now that you mention it. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I have a video reel somewhere of it's like a hundred blows. It takes a minute and a half. <laughs> wow. <That's> amazing. <laughs> Michael has a very punchable face. We, we can say that. <laughs> That's what my mother said when I was a kid. She said, wash your mouth. You have a punchable face. <laughs> no, well, you didn't listen. That's, that's my dear mother said that to me. <laughs> Is that a joke? <laughs> no. No. Oh. No, that's not a joke. It's, 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 it's a joke. <laughs> Christine, for you? Yeah, I was, I'm like Andrea. I was panicking because I, I can't really remember, but I think it was um, either... Spray and vac rug shampoo commercial or joy dishwashing liquid. And at the time, I remember I was a brand new, incredibly passionate, angry, um, enraged feminist and artiste. And the last thing I would ever do is portray a housewife on, you know, in a commercial. And then I got, you know, really, really tired of waitressing and waitressing and waitressing. And I thought, 
I think I, I could sell out just a little bit right now. So I did. I sold out in the hugest way. And spraying back rug shampoo commercial, um, I was dressed up in dungarees and like a bandana and kind of schlumpy. <laughs> all my clothes were Velcroed onto me and fish wire was um, connected to all the clothes. And I said, now you don't have to shampoo your rug looking like this. Now you can look like this. And everything flew off. The, all the, clothes, the dungarees and everything flew off. And underneath was this perfect little ensemble of polyester housewife outfit. And that wow. was my debut. Yeah. I swear I've seen this commercial. This ring <laughs> it really does. I want to see it now. I think I showed it on Letterman once because I wanted to humiliate myself before he could. You know how that works? <laughs> anyway. right. Also for you. Do you guys uh, remember a show called The Beverly Hillbillies? Yeah. yeah, yeah, good show. Um, <laughs> <laughs> not the show, not the show. Oh, not, oh so my not sad card, my sad yeah, card. I, I knew it. Uh, my sad card, I was in college and a, uh, a casting director came up and, 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 and we did a workshop and they cast me in the TV show Miami Vice. Mm. And I had, I had one line and at the time I was in Tampa, and I drove all the way down to Miami uh, to do this one line. And my line was, he went that way. <laughs> and, and I played the doorman <laughs> outside the Biltmore Hotel in Miami. And uh, Philip Michael Thomas and Don Johnson came running out of this hotel. They were looking for this bad guy. And, uh, and I was the doorman. And they were like, where did he go? <laughs> and I was like, he went that way. Um, <laughs> did, it, all right. did, they cut it? did they cut that part? Did they cut the line? No, no, I was in there and I had a huge party with all my, for all my friends to Aww. watch this episode <laughs> back when, before DVDs, you know, and so like you just watched it and, uh, and, and it was literally like, boom, that it was one, it was, that was it. Oh, but so it got me my sad card. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha for you. <laughs> um, it was my, my first American job, the show called Manhattan. Uh, <laughs> Shaw, and where I wow. met Christine's husband, Tommy Jami, who show ran or like uh, a, what's the, actually the word for that? Um, uh, he wasn't the show, like George. the overall director. He was the executive producer or producer director. Producing yeah, producing director. director. Um, yeah, but it was really hard because I was about to lose that job because I because I'm from from Europe and I I didn't have the papers, so. There was like I was there in the, in the desert of of Santa Fe, and they said you got to go to Ottawa right now to try to get a visa in one um, And then all the other castmates, um, Chernus and Ashley Zuckerman, and all the other ones, they were texting me like the the new girl who's you know who's here to take your role. She's much better staying in Canada, mm-hmm. <laughs> which was a joke, but it was it was very stressful. Um, but then I did get it in time and I, I yeah, did that oh, show. Good. The rest is history. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Andrea, did you find it? Well, I, I'm going to take a stab at this. I was literally thinking, can I walk to my wallet without them seeing to see if on the SAG card it says when I first got it? Does it? Does mm-hmm. it tell you the first Maybe member since? It member since, it'll say. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. I think it was a movie called um, Holy Moses. And if oh, it wasn't, oh yeah, remember that movie. And if it wasn't yeah. that movie, it was a movie called Soup for One. <laughs> but um, I think it was Holy Moses because what there was a difference between SAG and uh, they were two separate unions, um, right? And SAG was for movies in those days. In right. Days. Is that right? Who am I? Looking? Yes. We yeah. just murdered like ten years ago, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I'm going to go with Holy Moses. That's my final answer. That's a great <laughs> one. Let's ding, go ding, with ding. that. well again congratulations on a fantastic season of evil i'd actually like to go back to the beginning because this this show is it's it's the brainchild of the brilliant robert and michelle king but i'm curious when the project initially came to you what was sort of your reaction when you learned it would be you know a show with very serious themes but also dealing with the supernatural and and showing us things we'd never seen before. Uh, did you were you immediately excited, or did you think like who's going to want to watch that? And turns out everyone does. But um, and let's start with Katya. Um, well, the fact that it was Robert and Michelle King, and and that the role that they wrote that I got to play was so 
um, expansive made me want to do whatever, whatever it would be, even if we were go to, were to go to space. So I never, I never really thought about it in that way. It, um, I mean, Mike, you get to be, you know, you're coming from playing an action hero to playing another kind of action hero who is also a priest, studying to be a priest. Um, so many layers here. What what did you initially think of your character? Uh, you know, and the pilot was so, um, I guess the, the pilot didn't give you a lot to go on in terms of where these characters would go. Um, mm -hmm. But but I, I knew, I just knew Robert Michelle as writers. And, and that being said, when I read it, it didn't seem like anything they had ever, ever written before. So when I read it, I did I couldn't believe it was them because it was it was just like wow, this is Robert Michelle King. And so I read that and I thought to myself, wow, this is perfect because I was looking for something completely different. And I thought that this was something completely different for them. So it just seemed like the right time and the right you know situation. And uh, I, I just thought to myself, regardless of whether anybody else wants to watch it, you got to do stuff that you want to play. I mean, I, I think actors have two things they have to decide. Do you want to do something that you're sure a lot of people are going to watch, but you don't necessarily want to be a part of it. You know, it's like a career thing. Do you want to be happy with your work you're doing or do you just want to be, you know, something that's actually, you know, successful or popular? And it's a hard, it's a hard question. It seems, it, it seems uh, simple, but it's not. So you, you can't go by that because you don't know what's going to be successful. You have to just basically go by what you feel is something that you want to do. And that's all you can do. And if it turns out to be great and someone likes it, that's good. But uh, but the, in, in that regard, I read the script. I liked it. And I didn't know anything else about it other than the pilot was really interesting. And I wanted to see where this character was going to go. And did you I, find I, it? I, can I ask? Oh, go ahead. Can I ask yeah. a question? I'm sorry, Asif. I just wanted to ask Mike a question. Uh, All right. Did, yeah, go oh. ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I like that Kurt is moderating now. <laughs> no, no, no. I wanted to ask my question. As a no, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I, what, I don't so care. Go ahead. didn't know which way the show was going to go. You couldn't imagine the way it has played out? No, no not really. Because, I mean, the, even, even with the introduction of George in the first episode, you just never knew to, to what degree demons would be a part of the show moving forward. You didn't know how long... You could sustain that sort of that that sort of horror because I didn't think it was going to be a horror show, but it, it opened up with this possibility that anything could go, you know, that some things are going to be real. Some things are just going to be imagined. And at some point you talk about Robert Michelle having um, two um, opposing ideas, but respectfully disagreeing about things. It just meant, meant that at the end of the day, there wouldn't be necessarily any decisions made. You would just walk away feeling like your point of view was taken into account and that most people could, could say, hey, I feel pretty I feel I feel pretty represented by watching the show and I'm connected to the characters because they were so good at writing characters. Mm -hmm. So I, I just I just I, I believed in the Kings and, and that was enough for me to sort of jump off of this ledge and go, well, let's see where this David character goes. Well, thank you for an answer to a great question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to say that, that um, you know, when we when I read the script, I think off of what Mike was saying was that so many times you read pilots and, you, you, you know, you audition for them because whatever, you want a job, you know, and then every now and then you read something and you go, oh, this is actually really good. And, and you'd be surprised how not often that happens where you read something that's good. Most of the time you read stuff and you go like, ah, all right. You know, um, and this was one of those where I read it and uh, it was just, it just really held my attention and captivated me. And I was like really interested in this story and this world. And also like as, as a Brown guy in Hollywood, I didn't get to play a lot of guys who drive pickup trucks and, and, and fix things. I got to play a lot of doctors and, you know, and, uh, and doctors. And so um, I was just excited <laughs> about wearing flannel, really. <laughs> Kurt, for you, I, I actually am curious because up until this season, your character didn't really believe in or witness the supernatural. Did you ever say anything to the Kings? Like, when do I get to see a demon and uh, yeah. delivered? Well, that's, that's a good that's a good question, and since it's a SAG uh, thing, it's I'm going to give an accurately answer, which is because you know I'm I'm friend I have a history with the Kings, so I made a vow to myself to never ask for anything, to never make any, to never try and use the relationship to try and get something from the show, and yet I certainly wanted to, and. Uh, I'm glad that uh, this coming season, 
uh, there's a lot that happens in, in the second half of the mm-hmm. season. And it felt like a long time coming because everything else, the show was not in my wheelhouse, but the character has been in my wheelhouse. And now I'm personally, I'm out of my wheelhouse. And the thing that has surprised me about the show, I never thought it would be as funny as it is. And I never thought that the relationships between everyone would be as dynamic as they are. Mm-hmm. Even though I, I know how great the Kings are, I just didn't see how it was going to happen in this kind of show. And yet it did. And it's always the relationships between characters that keep you coming back. Yeah. Not the demons, not the difference. It's the relationships that keep you coming back. And uh, that's what I think is the gift this show has. And I can't help but notice your character's name is Kurt. Yeah. (laughs) Okay. Again, to the actors, uh, I was hired as a guest star. I think I was hired as a guest star because CBS at the time said, we're not making him a regular. (laughs) And (laughs) I think they gave me the name Kurt because they intended, hoped I would be good enough in the pilot. They could say, you know, we need, we need more, we need to make Kurt a regular. And I, I think that's how it happened. And I think that's why my name was Kurt. <laughs> and I, you know, God bless him. Which is why I don't. And you don't, him. you don't think it has anything to do with the onsetting Alzheimer's? That's. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> well, it's turned out to be fortuitous. If we call him Kurt, he'll always yeah, say his lines. Know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't like that when I read the script. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Well, also in season two, the great Andrea Martin joined the show. You're also sister Andrea. Um, were you a fan of the show prior to signing on? No, I've <laughs> never seen it. I have to be honest with you. Oh my I was God. too scared. I watched, I watched it. I, no, this is really the truth. I, I did watch a little bit of it because my sister's a huge fan and I had to turn it off. And I remember what the episode was. It was Katja in in her bed and there was a monster coming down from a ceiling and then she rushed into her girls rooms and hugged them. And I, then I couldn't go to, I was so scared. I couldn't sleep that night. Um, And so I, I never watched the show, but then they uh, asked me to do the part. And um, I thought it was going to be a huge um, challenge for me. I had not done with the exception of the good, good, the good fight. I'd never done any um, hour drama. So I, I was um, interested in doing that. Yeah. Uh, Similarly, Michael, I know your wife has worked with the Kings, even won an Emmy for it, but I think this is your first collaboration with them. Have you been sort of waiting for the opportunity? Yeah, I'm I'm happy to be part of the Kings repertory company. It's good. And and, uh, when I, I'm an actor who tries to follow good writing and the pilot script for this show was a page turner. You know, it really was quite gripping and the character they were asking me to play didn't have a lot to do in the first episode but I saw how he was being positioned as a really terrible person who had a little bit of a sense of humor about himself and I thought oh this could be a great deal of pleasurable mischief if I took this part so I did and it is (laughs) Did they, did you have any questions going in? Did they give you any sort of history of Leland or did you just sort of go along with it? No, I don't, I don't usually have those conversations. I I tend, I I don't need a lot of convincing either I'm in or I'm not. And, and uh, so I was just, I was ready to go and see where they were heading and they were heading into some really great and adult places I mean, do you think you would have played him differently in that first episode if you knew he was in marching band? Well, <laughs> no one was more surprised than me when he turned out to have a backstory that was very close to my own. And I thought, who's been Googling me, for God's sake? But uh, no, no, I, I think that's just good fun. I, I, I was delighted. You know, I felt like it was a sort of a private joke b- between the writer's room and myself. It tickled me. <laughs> and Christine, speaking of, of coming into the show, like I have watched Cheryl go from, you know, this this loving mother and grandmother. And I am now convinced that she's the most evil person on the show. Um, what did they tell you coming in? 
<laughs> well, there wasn't much in the pilot, um, as I recall. And it was for me, it was all about trusting the kings. Um, I had done an arc on the good fight and the good wife. And I, they're just so damn smart and topical and maybe most importantly, funny. And I hor horror is not my genre. I'm like Andrea. I I'm get too scared to watch it. S but this was so grounded in the psychological explanations rather than just the monsters that these were maybe in, from people's imaginations or represented representing the kind of psychosis or some kind of psychological uh, issue. Um, that that really attracted me to the material. But I didn't know much except that she was the kind of rock and roll great grandma who babysat yeah. and then you know I'm thinking well that, that doesn't sound too great and then <laughs> the kings basically said trust us and that's really easy to do with them so I did and then I've been so unbelievably delighted with um, just what you said that she has now become I'm not sure if she's evil or if she's trying to convince you that <laughs> she's evil oh she's so evil or, oh no, I'm, I'm not sure. I think that she's uh, she wants power, and in that sense, yeah. And she she's been held down for her whole life by men, and I think now it's time to it's Cheryl's turn. And and I think um, Leland should watch out. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> Wait, do you know something? Who me? I, I oh, think her. her. <laughs> I think I know something and I'm not saying no spoilers. <laughs> no one's told you anything. This is in your head. Yeah, uh -oh. it's my fantasy, but I have discussed it with certain people. Ooh, Look, nobody who collects dolls doesn't have something wrong with them. That's all I'm saying. She's definitely messed up. Definitely messed up. And again, her search for power, her need for power is not a feminine, you know, let's, let's define power as lifting others up. It's <laughs> hierarchical, patriarchal power. I want to squish and hold down men. And I think she's on, on the way. And I, I just think Leland should watch out. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I mean, even though this show delves into the supernatural, it's actually incredibly grounded in so many ways. You know, there are these these big emotions I think we can relate to. I'm sort of curious how you prepared and researched these roles. Did Is there like a crash course on the Bible or Catholicism or, you know, some of you have said you're not horror fans. How do you sort of prepare for this material? Well, you know, I don't think there's any shortcut or any quick crash course of learning to be a priest. Um, I think, I think the suit does most of the work. You know, you put that suit on, all of a sudden it's like, well, look, look at that guy. He's, he's a priest. Um, I, I think, you know, I trust the writing. I, I do a little bit of research in terms of what it's going to take to, to, you know, make me feel like this character. But oddly enough, I have a friend named David who was an actor at one point, and he went into um, the ministry as well and changed his whole life's direction. And I knew him for a very long time. So when he went to his other direction, it was something that, you know, I, I didn't see coming. And I, and I, and I can't quite describe it, but he sort of turned into a different person and I, and it's nothing like the old person. And and I totally respect him for doing that, but it's just a, it's like watching someone just turn to someone completely different. And I thought it was odd that I got this role of this character named David. And and I, I called him and said, you know, this is interesting, but I, I have this character and and I, I sort of use him as a little bit of a inspiration because it just out of nowhere, he decided that this was what his life was gonna be. And before that he was, a, you know, he was bartending in you know, nightlife and, just just looking for something. I'm not sure what he was looking for. And I felt like he was a little bit lost. And I think for him, this was, you know, this was his journey. And now he's, you know, he's, he has like these uh, storefront churches. I mean, he's really just moved into a situation where he's just his whole life is devoted towards that. And um, he's almost un unrecognizable um, in, in some way, but I still recognize him. I, I still, I still connect with him, but there's something completely different about him that just I can't explain. So I, I, I look at him and I sort of look at him as an inspiration for the role, because if he could do that, I guess anything is possible, you know? Do you know if he watches the show at all? You know, I never, I, I think he does, <laughs> but I don't ask because it's one of those things where, I mean, to be quite honest, because when you're, when you're talking to someone who actually is doing that in, in their life, sometimes it's hard to break bro broach that subject because then you get a lot more information than you want. Like I, I think acting, you know, acting is acting. And sometimes people are like, we have a, we have a technical advisor on the show that actually does exercise demons. I don't talk to him a lot because 
sometimes he says stuff I don't really want to know. You know, things he says to me, sometimes I go, I don't really want to know that. So I kind of want to give David his own freedom to to explore. And um, so I sort of leave some things to myself to create and, and not, you know, talk to people about certain things. How, how much do any of you talk to this technical advisor? This is fascinating. <laughs> I'll speak for everyone. Very little. Really? <laughs> I, 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 I think so. I mean, does anyone talk to him? That often, no, no, no. I mean, there it's it's useful when it comes to the details of uh, how, what are the tools that an exorcist carries yes. to the event, and how does he handle them? Yes, those and are what what kind of ritual handling do they require? What's the timing and order of the liturgy of those events? That that stuff's that's useful to have. <laughs> Well, I mean, this season, Leland, there's so many levels here because he's going through an exorcism, but he's sort of pretending to be possessed or maybe he's not. I'm curious, did you consult with him on how to behave? No, you you don't want to ask a stranger what people look like. I, nor would I ask a psychologist, you know, who, who's the craziest person you have that visits you regularly, you know, how do they do it? Uh, you know, we, we've all seen enough bizarre behavior and madness in the media. I think we have some idea. Or you just break it apart into little pieces in your actor brain and try to come up with something. Maybe, maybe something that's unlike anything you've ever seen or heard, but feels right. Andrea, for you coming coming into the show, and and Sister Andrea seems to know everything. So I'm sort of curious how you prepared for this character. Um, you know, it, I I'm going to tell you how I prepared and how I continue with the part. Um, so there's there's a wonderful nun, and maybe some of you know her name is um, Sister Simone Campbell, and. Um, uh, you know, she did a documentary called um, Nuns on the Bus, and they traveled around. This is when yes. Obamacare was trying to get through, and they really supported it. And um, so I've been following her, and I just watched a lot of videos with her, the combination of um, faith and humor and uh, activism and uh, great um, compassion, but at the same time, great belief in her faith. And it's really guided me through through this part. Um, and I watch it I, every time, every day that I shoot, I watch 20 minutes of her speaking. It's a, it's a fabulous combination that the Kings have written, actually, because it is humorous, but she's uncompromising in her faith. So she's, com yeah, it's, and it's not a part that I've played before. And um, I don't know many people like that, actually. Uh, um, I'd love to meet her one day. I just think that I, I watched her on, on Stephen Colbert once, and he was um, carrying on about whatever. I don't even remember what the joke was. I love him. But, but she answered in a way that wasn't off-putting, but still ha held on to the belief that she had about Jesus, about Catholicism, about faith, but still fit into this late night formula. It was um, so compelling. So it's, she's kind of guided me through this. Um, That's so cool. Yeah. <clears throat> um, Kurt referenced how much we care about all these characters and this ensemble works so well together and everybody, uh, you know, it's not just like, you know, uh, Katja and, and, and Mike having great scenes together. You're, you guys are great with Asif and Katja with Kurt and now Christine with Kurt. I'm sort of curious, did, did all that chemistry just sort of happen naturally? Uh, you know, it, it, was there something, you know, when, you, when you're working together, do you have time to... <laughs> you know, have fun on set, even when you're dealing with heavy material. And is it weird that I'm kind of rooting for Leland and Cheryl? <laughs> Actually, <laughs> We have a very light set. We're always laughing. Really? Yeah, there's there's very little um, there's very little drama or heaviness, I'd say. I think there's sometimes when you're dealing with incredibly heavy material or or just heavy subject matter, sometimes it's a release valve so that off camera there's a lot of humor and a lot of goofing around that happens. Um, you know, I think I, I always find that like when I've done really dramatic work, it's, it's, that's the time when actors just need to like release energy, you know, when they're not on camera. So uh, I feel like we have a good time and I think everyone actually, you know, it, 
I have, except for one person here, and I won't say who, everyone really gets along with everyone. <laughs> Kurt. Can I say something? I'm, a, I'm not saying any names. I'm, Wait, just, I'm not I'm throwing anyone under the bus. I'm just saying. Unlike Asif, I'm going to say something interesting. Uh, <laughs> it's been a little different in this show. You know, sometimes uh, you're on a show and you guys can do things together. It's not just on the set. You get to know each other a little bit. Because of COVID, we, we couldn't for two years go out together. Mm -hmm. We couldn't go anywhere. We never had a meal. We never were anywhere uh, after work. So everything, everything. Mm -hmm. The I rest of us did. Incredibly, uh, well, maybe you guys have been going out, but I've been told that it was COVID and we couldn't. But uh, <laughs> now the secret's out. Awesome. We've all been uh, going out. <laughs> for two years. Without Kurt. Without Kurt. That's so cool. <laughs> this is amazing. This hurts. This is, this is, uh, it's amazing that how cohesive and how, I mean, this is really, uh, this cast, we really like each other. And it's all happened on the set, really. And it's, it's, there's a lot of work, and, and especially for those you three, it's a tremendous amount of work. Uh, and it, you guys have maintained, I mean, the fish rots from the head down or it does well from the head down. And, uh, you know, you guys who were there every single day have kept it together. And uh, I, having been parts of shows where that didn't happen, really appreciate it. And I think you guys are, uh, have done great. And, and it's because of you, you guys. So... And the Kings, of course, that's the big head of the fish. Yeah. Well, I remember that they asked me to um, to chemistry read with with Mike uh, when when they were thinking about giving me the part. And, and I was shooting a movie back home in Holland and I, I really had no time to do that, nor did I want to, um, because I thought if I if I go and audition, I might not get it. So I, I kind of kept saying, I, I can't make it. I can't make it. I'm too busy. So it was really kind of very lucky. We never chemistry read and, and we do have chemistry. None of us ever met each other except I already knew Christine well. But you knew I, of me. You knew of my I knew of you, the legend you are. <laughs> um, yeah. Oh, that's cool. By the way, for actors, the best way to lose a role is to read for it. So, <laughs> I've heard that. You were very smart, Katja. Yeah. Um, I was just going to say that uh, the Kings also encourage, um, at least when I, what I feel, and maybe I've misinterpreted this, but they encourage improv. So I love, I love the idea that we get to play and, you know, sometimes they have to make the call to Robert or, or Michelle and say, is it okay if they change the line or is it whatever? But I find there's a lot of play on set and we can come up with stuff and all of us, I think, love that aspect of it. And, and I think everyone here is really good at it, at, it, at that, um, as well as being really professional and just kind, decent people. And that's, it's, we're really lucky. I'm going to guess, correct me if I'm wrong, that Asif is probably the biggest improviser. Um, I'm curious what it was like to shoot an episode where your characters couldn't speak. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> it was actually kind of weirdly um, freeing uh, because we had to convey everything with just our facial expressions and, and, and the way they sort of had structured it. Uh, the, 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 and so it actually forced us as actors to, to find different, different ways because words can sometimes be just a crutch or a tool that you can use. All right, I have a question about the silent episode. Did you feel, you three, who hardly spoke, did you feel... Like after that 10 days, that's 10 solid days, basically of not talking, which never happens. Do you feel like you learned something about acting that you didn't know before? Well, I think- You could do less, you could do more. I, I, I remember, I always remember, remember this moment and uh, it was undergrad, I did a play and I remember doing this play and for the first 20 minutes of the play, my character didn't speak. And, and I remember having this moment of thinking to myself, after I did that, I learned so much more about acting because I couldn't speak. And I realized that it was just so much more to it without, without words. And um, it never happened again, I don't think, but, but I always thought to myself, I did learn so much more about conveying 
uh, emotions and conveying thought without having any words. And, and on a stage where you have to fill up an auditorium and people are trying to, to understand what's happening. And I found people were more captivated because they couldn't hear words and they were just waiting for every, every moment, every, 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 every movement. So um, for me, it was nice to go back to doing that again. I was also intimidated because I was thinking to myself, wow, it's been a long time, no words. Okay. Mm, this should be easy, uh, interesting. And uh, I, I think it turned out pretty well. Can I say a funny or funny a, a sort of profound quote that might be embarrassing? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Please. So <laughs> my my late stepfather, who was a, a great cellist, um, Honor Billsma, he he always said, um, the music is in the silence, mm. in the in the notes in between. And I, I think that's really beautiful. Katya, that you in that episode, uh, the focus, because you couldn't talk, the focus on physical, on the physical, and you uh, and the wine uh, with the grapes was like some of the greatest comedy I was oh, now talking and you're just you used your body and your face mm -hmm. and no words but it was just, it was so beautiful and funny and classic and that is when, when you are when you're funny. not talking Katya you're hilarious that's <laughs> <laughs> what she's saying if you don't talk you're really funny <laughs> <laughs> well, again, it is such a fantastic show. I want to remind everyone that the third season will be back on June 12th. I cannot wait on Paramount Plus. On behalf of the SAG After Foundation, thank you so, so much for joining us and for sharing your experiences with your fellow actors. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you.